What I'm going to take you through here very quickly and very briefly is, let's call it the road to normality. What are we going to emerge into? But before I do that, let me make a very brief comparison. Imagine right now the state of the global supply chain is we are in a building that's on fire, which means that the solution at hand is we're going to keep pouring water on until the fire is put out. That makes sense. But when we then look at the point when the fire is put out, we're not going to continue to pour water on the building just to prevent new fires. That would be the completely wrong thing to do. What we do want to make sure we do going forward is we change the way we construct the building to limit the risk of new fires. And if fires were to emerge again, limit the risk of them spreading. What I'm saying here is the initiatives we need to undertake in the supply chain over the next 12 to 18 months to get back to normal are not the right initiatives for how do we then deal with the supply chain in a post-pandemic period. Those are two very different things. There are tactical elements right now to clean up the mess. And then there's dealing with the post-pandemic reality, which is very, very different. Now, the way to think about it, I'm only going to spend very limited time talking about how we got to where we are. But basically, this is how we got to where we are. Every time there has been a minor disruption, we have ripples coming from it. Then you have pandemic. Demand drops. Vessel sailings get cancelled. That means empty containers end up in the wrong places. That increases freight rates. That means shippers get desperate to move cargo. More ships are put in. That creates congestion in the terminals. That means longer turn time for the trucks. Now we have a shortage of trucks so on and so forth. And that leads us to where we are today. The problem is we are in a proverbial traffic jam in the global supply chain. And the honest reality is this is going to take a long time to fix. There is no easy short-term solution. It doesn't exist. Realistically, and I could spend hours talking about it, this is going to take at least 6 to 12 months to unravel. So we're looking towards the end of 2022 before we can hope for a normal world again. And that is the optimistic view if there's not too many curveballs thrown at us. Part of this traffic jam, of course, means we are soaking up capacity. Vessels that are sitting in queues cannot move cargo. And we are at a point where 12% of global capacity has basically been unavailable for months. 10 to 12% has been gone for most of this year. It is basically three times the event we saw when Hanjin went bankrupt a couple of years ago, and this is persisting. It's going to last months into the future. We have enough ships in the world. That's not the problem. The problem is they are not moving. When they're not moving, that means there's a fight. So there's a fight over the vessels that are available. This pushes up charter rates. So you're now seeing uh, vessels that are being chartered out at up to a quarter million dollars a day that used to cost 10000 this means vessels are being removed, especially from smaller regional trades. There are ports, there are even island nations in the world right now that don't have enough capacity to service their region because vessels are pulled out and put into trades where they can command a much, much higher premium. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, the congestion is clearly global. And if I look ahead for the next few months, the odds are this is going to get worse. It is not going to get better in the short term. That's, of course, not a very nice message, but think it through. The highest risk is and has been for months more major port shutdowns in China. Keep in mind, for COVID, it's not just a matter of how does COVID spread. It's about the political response to COVID. And China has made their position very clear over the last year. Just a few incidents will shut down an area. This has led to the shutdown of Yanchen port. It led to the shutdown of one of the terminals in Ningbo. It led to the shutdown of air freight operations in Shanghai. We are only ever two sick port workers in Shanghai away from Shanghai port shutting down. That risk is not only still there, it seems to have heightened with the emergence of the new Omicron variant. So chances here are, if you're a gambling man, this might very well happen again. If you look at the US, there are multiple reasons here that we can also see this worsening. Increasing fuel prices, put already stretched truckers under pressure. This might lead some of them to say, fine, I'm going to call it a day. I'm just not going to move. You have the risk of vaccination mandates. Half of them are not vaccinated. If they're suddenly not allowed to work, then we have another problem. We have negotiations with the unions coming up that has at least the potential of disruption. And from 2023, we have new environmental regulations. I get a deja vu. This is like uh, IMO 2020 and low sulfur. We knew low sulfur was coming for 10 years. Yet nobody really did anything until that was 12 months out and it dawned upon everyone, oh my God, we've got to do something. 
IMO 2023, same thing. There is not a good overview on what this is actually going to mean. Realistically, this might not be an issue on the major deep sea trades. This could be a potential big issue on any regional trade because they are serviced by older, smaller vessels that might actually have challenges living up to the new regulations. So we got plenty of additional topics ahead of us. This, of course, has led to spot rates searching far beyond anything that we have ever seen before. I'm not really going to dwell on that. And part of that is due to this extreme increase in demand, especially into the US. And one of the things here that is critically important to keep in mind is, as I showed you before, this is global. Part of this is we've got a lot of vessels that are being drawn into the US due to a consumer boom. That boom, to a significant degree, is driven by a change in consumer behavior, away from buying services over to buying goods. This is a drastic change in behavior. We haven't seen anything like it for three generations. We have data going back to 1959, the entire history of container shipping. We've never seen consumers change behavior like this before. This is, of course, not because they chose to. This is the pandemic effect which also means there is another disruptive force ahead of us. As the pandemic then gradually dissipates, or at least we we'll learn to live with it, it's very likely the consumers there will change behavior back to where we came from. That means there is a spectrum ahead of us. At some point in time, we might see a huge drop in demand, which of course would be great for cleaning up congestion, not so great for demand and making money on logistics. So plenty of things that can change. Looking slightly further out, what we could also look at is underlying. The container shipping sector is in a cyclical upturn. It's just hidden underneath all this pandemic noise. We would have been that anyway, because there has been very low injection of capacity versus demand for the last few years. It's a normal cyclical upturn. The vessels that have been delivered means this upturn is likely going to end second half 2023, unless we get this impact from the IMO 2023 rules that could mean that this upturn might continue even longer. Carriers have ordered a few of the ultra-large ones, but increasingly they're ordering new Panamaxes, which means that, sure, vessels are not going to get larger on Asia Europe, but they are indeed going to get larger in all other trades still. We're still going to see many more trades come in, and that also means we are still going to see a drive towards more larger ships, fewer weekly services, more transshipment. That's going to impact all regions, including the regions down here. So what will happen in 22 and 23? This is a transition period, getting away from the massive problems until we get to a new reality. Again, as I mentioned operationally, if you are being super, super optimistic, you can make the case for six months. That appears highly unrealistic. More realistic is sometime second half 2022 if we don't get too many curveballs, which we might. And it is not going to be a smooth transition. It is going to be exceedingly volatile. You're going to see places around the world where suddenly congestion seems to evaporate. That is brilliant, only to then come back a month or two later. You're going to have a lot of these fits and starts. It's going to be a very, very turbulent period. It's not going to be a clean and easy transition. We got some dark numbers in terms of demand. There is cargo in containers not being moved, not being counted. Cargo at factories not being loaded into containers. Deferred production. So we have another surge of demand, and there is not a single number in the world showing how big that is. So in the short term, we're going to see more problems leading up to Chinese New Year. And are we then going to see somebody pay for building more resilience to fix the current problems? The short answer is no. We are not going to see a sustained willingness to pay for steel and cement. Don't make the mistake of thinking we are going to see customers be willing to have an armada of ships lying just in case, or to vastly overbuild on terminals just in case. That is not going to happen. We should expand in line with normal markets, but nobody is going to be willing to pay for resilience. And does that mean that we might run into this same problem again in the future? Actually, it does. Having a tenfold increase in freight rates might be unusual in container shipping, perfectly normal in other parts of shipping, because in other parts of shipping, they don't have a grotesque amount of overcapacity. And the container shipping industry is maturing and will also in the future not have a grotesque amount of overcapacity. So most of the time, everything will be fine. And then once in a blue moon, yeah, there will be a supply chain crunch and we might see prices spike tenfold, just like we see completely normally 
in the other shipping sectors because, again, nobody is willing to have an armada of extra ships lying around just to cater for those few spike events. Not going to happen. And let me then finish on what is this post-pandemic reality that we're going to emerge into. Keep in mind, we were going to get there anyway. The pandemic just accelerates it. There is a major fight over logistics. This is for the control of the cargo owner. This is a fight that's been fought between the existing freight forwarders, digital freight forwarders, carriers jumping into this, major diversified cargo owners like Amazon and Alibaba jumping into the freight, and you even have some terminal operators themselves entering into this. This is going to be a massive battle over logistics that will unfold over the coming years. Digitalization is going to be driven extremely hard, but don't make the mistake of thinking if you digitalize, then you will become profitable. That would be a clean mistake. Digitalization is what you need to do to stay alive, but it will not make you profitable. Think about it from this perspective. If everything goes according to plan, nobody touches it in terms of the information. It runs automatically. But when things do not go according to plan in logistics, there's always something that goes wrong. Then there's a breakdown of a crane, there's a truck that runs off the road, there's a typhoon, whatever have you. How good are your people in then handling that plan B? That's where competition is going to move to. But you're not going to be part of that competition unless you truly digitalize end to end. And that brings me to the next point, the resilience. The resilience does not come from more steel and more cement. It comes from better usage of data. That comes from having the ability to predict when there might be bottlenecks to avoid them in the first place. That requires a level of data integration across all supply chain stakeholders globally. There are a few small local initiatives and port community systems that is wholly insufficient. This needs to be a global drive. We need better data standards. We need to exchange data across shipping lines, ports, port authorities, terminals, trucking companies, rail companies, warehousing firms, the whole lot. That is where we're going to move in order to have a more resilient future. Again, this will take time. Once we get to that point, you will also see you're going to see an increased reliance on fewer but larger hubs. This is driven by the larger vessels I told you about. So there's another battle that's ahead of us in this decade on the container terminal side, not so much for import exports, but especially for transshipments. What you will see over the next decade is we will see larger transshipment hubs, but fewer of them. And this is going to be a dangerous game for the transshipment terminals because on one hand you need to expand to have an attractive product to the carriers, but you have no guarantee you might actually land them. So whereas the carriers have spent the last 20 years first building massive amounts of overcapacity in sort of a game theoretic approach, that's the prospect that now face especially transshipment terminals going forward. That was an extremely rapid and condensed view as you might be able to hear. I could talk about this topic for hours but I won't take uh, more time away from the rest of my panel. So thank you very much.